Do you guys see me? Yes, we can see you and we are live. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this, I guess, third to last webinar in the 2020 Emergency Preparedness Network COVID-19 webinar series. And today we are going to talk about caring for the caregiver. And we're going to hear about that through the lens of a CNA named Ama Adepagren. She is um, been a CNA working in home care for many years, and we are really pleased to hear what she has to say. I'm Dr. Charlene Brown from CNA Simulations VR, working closely with Minka and EPN and the Maryland Office of Preparedness and Response to put this webinar series together. We wanted to take a moment and spotlight Jan Carisi, who is the Associate Director of the Emergency Preparedness Network. She is working behind the scenes, making sure that everybody is getting the email notifications about the webinars and the reminders about the webinars. And we wanted to spend a moment and just say thank you, Jan, for being you. Next to her is Don C. Kuzi, Executive Director of MINCA as well. And if you're wonder wondering what MINCA is, it's the Maryland National Capital Home Care Association. You can learn more about it at MINCA.org. It's the trade association for home care agencies of all types in Maryland and DC. This entire webinar series is brought to you by the Office of Preparedness and Response at the Maryland Department of Health, and we are grateful to them. Um, if you'd like to join Minka, learn more about Minka, the website is there, or you can contact Dawn Seek at minka.org, M-N-C-H-A.org. You are, if you're attending the webinar, you are on the mailing list for EPN, so we will continue to get notifications about upcoming webinars and other emergency preparedness issues that are of import to people working in home care. And of course, if you'd like to learn more about CNA simulations, you can go to my website at cnasimvr.com. There are two more webinars in the series. We've done 13, including today will be 13 webinars and we have two more for a total of 15. Thank you for those of you who have stuck with us throughout the entire journey since the summer. And next Monday, you'll be able to hear from me at 4 p.m. I'll be talking about aerosols and COVID-19, what home care clinicians need to know. And on December 22nd, that's Tuesday, we have two more CNAs, Angel Jackson and Wendell Anderson, who have created a talk show called Let's Talk CNAs. They'll be coming and joining us and talking about how CNAs can protect their clients from COVID-19 outside the workplace. And I know that one of the topics they're gonna to talk about is the CNA perspective on vaccines. Let's introduce Alma again. So Anna, Alma is a Ghanaian immigrant who has been in home care for many years. I met her back in 2016 when she was not only working full-time as a CNA, but she was also going to school at Montgomery College and um, seemed to be juggling quite a number of things. And so that energy and that ability to manage many things is why she's been such an outstanding CNA in home care, but also why she graduated from Montgomery College and is now an undergraduate student at University of Maryland. She is studying accounting. So as a senior caregiver specialist for Caregiver Jobs Now, Alma actually spent years talking to hundreds, if not thousands of CNAs, home health aides, personal care aides, and more about their careers. And even in preparation for today's webinar, she actually conducted even more interviews to understand um, how caregivers, caregiving professionals are coping with the pandemic and to inform her talk about caring for the caregiver. So I'm excited to introduce Amma, but before, before we switch over to Amma, we're gonna have a poll that Amma has asked us to run. So Nasan, take it away. All right, just go ahead and there are three questions. If you take a few moments to answer them, we'll, you know, we'll wait and then we'll see what the results are. All right, Nasa, why don't we see what the results are of the poll? It 
Interesting. So how often do you feel any of these emotions since the pandemic, fear, anxiety, or anger? Um, the majority of people have felt it sometimes or often. Um, the majority of you feel like you have the necessary skills to deal with those feelings. And the majority of you think your employer has done enough to support you during the pandemic. All right, wonderful. Well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ama. All right, all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Charlene. Thank you, Nasan. And also, I want to say a very big thank you to the Maryland Prepared, uh, Emergency Preparedness Network for having me to, you know, talk about caregivers. Any talk about caregivers is exciting to me, so I'm very grateful. I also want to say a very big thank you to our audience for today. Um, it's a cold day outside, and you've all taken time to... <clears throat> to listen to me, so I'm very grateful. Um, it is no doubt that this year has been a challenging one for everybody, but most of, um, especially for those of us who find ourselves in the healthcare industry. Uh, many of us have had to pull out some skills that we haven't used in a while. Um, and in addition to that, we've also had to make a lot of sacrifices, you know, just to keep the system working. When I speak with caregivers, um, there are four key words that stand out to me in our conversation. And they are fear, anger, disappointment, and anxiety. And I feel like whether you work in healthcare or not, these you know, emotions resonate with you know, each and every one this year. For us caregivers, we are afraid because we have such a close you know, um, relation, relationship with our clients that we feel we can you know, have ourselves exposed to the COVID virus or, you know, uh, and transfer it to our clients, or we can even pick it up from our clients. Um, other caregivers are, are in anger because um, our plans have been distorted. Many of us had so many plans that we wanted to execute this year, but due to the pandemic, we haven't been able to. Um, at the beginning of this, you know, world-changing event, a lot of caregivers were very disappointed. And it was due to the fact that when healthcare heroes were mentioned, um, the support staff like we, the nursing assistants, the home health aides, and even the PCAs, we were not included on that list. So many of us feel a sense of disappointment. And then anxiety. Because um, majority of the clients that we work for are aged, a lot of their family members do not feel comfortable having us come into their homes. And we are anxious about when our next job, where our next job is going to come from, um, how we are even going to keep up with, you know, the bills that we have. In addition to a lot of caregivers having to stay at home with their children and helping them through school. Um, all these emotions put together, you know, puts us caregivers in despair. But the truth of the matter is COVID-19 is going to be with us you know, for a very long time. But I think um, I'm grateful that you know, there is this vaccine that you know, is going to hopefully help all of us, but it's gonna be here for a while. And as such, we need to develop setting skills and you know, create setting awareness for ourselves to keep us sane and also to keep us going and help the system to work. And this is what my presentation today is going to be about from the caregiver's perspective. The first part of the presentation is going to focus on uh, me talking to my fellow caregivers about some of the things that they can do to care for themselves during this time. And then from there, I will switch over to speak with the employers based upon the um, research that I have done in my conversation with caregivers, just speaking to employers to inform them about how they, you know, they can support caregivers during this time. So um, to start with, I would like to share a picture of my parents and Charlene will share it very quickly. Um, this is a picture. This is a picture of my mother and my father. 
In 2005, my father had his very first stroke and this was in Ghana. Um, as soon as my father got sick, my mother, in addition to my siblings and I became my father's primary caregivers. But a lot of the burden fell on my mother because she, um, we had to go to school and she didn't have to um, work. So she had to stay at home and take care of my father. In 2015, my father had another major stroke, which led to him losing his mobility and also his speech. When my father was discharged and he came home, one of the first thing my sister, my sister who lives in um, London did at the time was to remove my mother from Ghana so that she could spend some time um, in London. And at the time, none of us, um, None of us siblings understood what the intention of my sister was. We felt like my, my mother had to be with my, you know, my father so that she could take care of him and help him get better. But my sister, who is an intensive care nurse, she understood why it was important for her to remove my mother from you know, um, having to go through so much with my dad. And that brings me to my first you know, point. As caregivers, we need to learn to take breaks. Um, caregiving is a calling. If you are not called to be a caregiver, you would not succeed at it, at it which is very similar to other, you know, um, other careers. But caregiving is a very emotional job. I was reading an article very recently which talked about how spouses or individuals who care for a sick person end up falling sick themselves or even passing away. And this is due to you know, the difficulty of the, the, the quality of the job and also the emotional aspects of it, having to worry about someone. I know some caregivers who um, have had to work double shifts all seven days of the week during this pandemic because most places are understaffed. So caregivers um, have had to work more, but par uh, prioritizing rest is very, very important. I read a post that said, um, if you don't prioritize your body to take rest, your body will take one for you. And it will be on a day that you do not want which often is the case. I've been a victim of it. Being a caregiver, um, juggling work, juggling school, I've fallen sick at times when I was like, no, my body cannot do this to me. My, my body said, yes, this is the time for you to rest. You didn't listen, so you're going to get it. And it wasn't something that I appreciated at all. And I have come to appreciate the importance of rest. Um, scientists also add um, to this knowledge by, you know, advising that when we have rest, we are not just, you know, we are not just resting to go back to our normal lives to do the things that we want to do, but it affects even our cognitive ability in our thinking, in our um, as caregivers, when you are uh, caregivers who have to pass medication so that you don't make mistakes. When you are tired, you are not a very pleasant person to be around, you know. All these things go to add to the fact that rest is very important. And even though so much is demanded of us as caregivers during this time, we need to make rest a priority. And someone might ask, how do I prioritize break, you know, my that my, my job needs me, I need to be there. Well, we can start by sleeping. Um, some of us need more sleep than others. And as a caregiver who worked nights for three years, I can tell you how that distorts your, um, not, not having enough sleep can distort your body's you know, function and processes. You, are, you do not eat well, um, and because you're not eating well, your body is, you know, you are not as happy as you want to be. Your, your thinking capacity is all over the place. It's all over the place. Um, doctors recommend between seven to nine hours of sleep. 
And for most caregivers, I don't really have the average number, but I know that at one point I was telling people that, oh, I, I'm fine on four hours of sleep. And I know that is not true, but I had you know, trained myself to accept the fact that four or five hours of sleep was enough for me. Now that I have a, a greater understanding on the, uh, the importance of sleep, <clears throat> excuse me, and I've been able to, you know, put aside um, so many of the things that were taking a lot of my time. I appreciate how my body is functioning. I feel like I'm a more pleasant person and I smile more now because I'm always in a good mood. So it is very important for us as caregivers to put ourselves first and prioritize rest. Um, one of the things that I also want to say is, um, a lot of caregivers, I mean, immigrant caregivers that I have come in contact with will tell you, um, I will sleep when I'm dead. Well, guess what? There are some caregivers who have actually, you know, prophesied this from the, for themselves. Um, I, I personally work with a caregiver who passed away due to the fact that she wasn't having enough, enough rest. She was jumping from one bus to the other, working the whole time. And one day on the J2 bus going to work in Bethesda, she suffered a heart attack. So rest is so important that, and I'm gonna to talk to the employers about, about it a little bit when I go to the employer side. Rest is so important and it is actually not overrated not overrated. Um, another way that we can also prioritize breaks is learning how to say no. Um, my aunt is a 70 year old caregiver who um, retired five years ago, but because she doesn't want to just be at home and not have a whole lot to do, she still takes cases here and there, short hours and, you know, um, sometimes long hours. But even with her, 95% of the email that she receives and the text messages that she receives are from employers who want her to work. And sometimes she would tell me, oh, if I were to be, if I were still to be a spring chicken, I would take this case and I would take that case. And she tells me this all the time. But one thing that my aunt has also instilled in me as a caregiver, my aunt actually encouraged me to become a caregiver. One of the values that she has instilled in me is to learn how to say no. She says, a lot of caregivers do not know how to say no because our work is seasonal. Like right now, caregivers are being called from here and there. But there are also times when the caregiving, um, the caregiving cases do not, you know, do not come as often. So you find a caregiver working 24 hours a day because they are, they are afraid that when there is a shortage of caregiving jobs, they would at least have a little bit of money saved so that they can take care of themselves. But honestly, my aunt always tells me that did not help me. I developed high blood pressure because I was always in a hurry trying to get to the next job. I developed diabetes. I was not eating well. I gained so much weight all because I didn't learn how to say no. And it's not just her. My aunt has a network of about 13 women who are all caregivers that she speaks to. And all of them also resonate the same, you know, echo the same um, echo the same thing to me. So as caregivers, we need to know our limits and know when to say no. Employers will call you, you know, often to um, go work for them because a case just came, which is a which is wonderful news. But we need to know our limit to know when to say yes and when to say no. Because guess what? When you cannot take care of yourself and you fall sick, you are of no you become of no use to a caregiver. And this statement that I'm repeating is a statement that an employer actually repeated to me. She said this was in 2013. An employer said to me, Ama, go home and take care of yourself. Because guess what? Right now, you are of no use to me. And unless you can take care of yourself, I am not going to allow you to be here. There are some, um, I've worked with some agencies that will not allow their caregivers to work more than eight hours and 12 hours maximum. As soon as you hit that, um, as soon as you hit that, 
uh, the, the set number, that's 60 hours, they will not allow you to work anymore, which is wonderful because if you leave us caregivers, we just want to work. So we're going to keep working. Um, another way that caregivers can also take care of themselves during this time is to practice self-compassion. As caregivers, we have been trained to be so empathetic and to have compassion for everyone around us, except ourselves. You know, we have so much feeling for our clients and all of that. But when it comes to projecting that same self-compassion on ourselves, we are at a miss. We don't even know how to practice it. And um, I, learned, I learned how to practice self-compassion from um, a Yale, um, Yale University professor named Laura Santos, who um, teaches a course on actually the science of happiness. And she was talking about practicing self-compassion. And when we practice self-compassion, we put ourselves in perspective and we create, we become self-aware. So the same way that we speak to our client, when our client is having a bad day, we, we encourage them. We need to do the same for ourselves. And trust me, it is really hard. It's easy for you to go to someone, pat them on the back, give them a hug, and tell them that I wish you well, may you be well, may you be this, may you be that. But when it comes to projecting that same kind of energy on ourselves, we are tamis and you know, we don't know how to do it. So according to, um, according to Dr. Dr. Laura Santos, to practice self-compassion, you know, we can, you can do it at any time, but the very simple way of doing it is to um, encourage yourself and say things like, um, I wish you well today. Um, may you be blessed. May you feel love. May you, um, whatever you want to say. So for me, example, I, I, I say things like, may you excel in your classes. You know, may you be kind to your clients. And I, as I'm saying that, you know, um, it kind of like, it relaxes me and it keeps me calm and it energizes me to do more because I feel like, it, it's telling me that I'm worth more and I can, when I feel like I'm, I'm worth more, I can also do more for others. Um, another way that I'm also taking care of myself during, you know, this pandemic time is practicing the, um, is practicing gratitude, right? So um, when I, when, when you practice gratitude, you don't leave any space in your mind to think about the things that are going wrong. Um, there are caregiver, um, I spoke with a caregiver the other day who was telling me about how, you know, all the all the clients on her, on the floor that she was work, working at, the clients were, were passing away one room to the other. It was like they had lined them up and there was a roster which was deciding who was to go next. And she felt so bad about, you know, this situation that she ended up quitting her job. And it was, it was just terrible. And how can this, this caregiver was telling me because of that, she was so worried, she was so scared. She didn't work for, um, between May and September, she didn't work at all. And she was so broken. So for this caregiver, for an example, you know, I encourage her, just be grateful. How, what are some of the things in your life that have gone right? How can you be grateful to, you know, grateful for these things? And when we, like I already said, when we practice the art of gratitude, we don't leave any room in our mind to think about the things that, you know, have gone wrong, the things that didn't happen for us, all the negative things that are happening in the world because we are grateful for our family and we are grateful for the provision that has been made. And we are grateful for, you know, having um, a wonderful network like this to talk about the needs of caregivers. Um, that is the first part for caregivers. And that brings me to, um, the part that I want to speak to employers. So um, during this time, like I already said, caregivers have had to really show out and they've had to really put on, you know, put their best foot forward. And even though employers have also done well, there are some caregivers who feel like employers should have 
um, have done more. Employers, some employers have provided um, food. Some employers have provided um, training for caregivers to know how to um, handle this COVID situation. Others have provided um, PPE for their caregivers. But there was one caregiver who was telling me that I wish my employer had provided more um, COVID tests because I was so worried that at any point in time, I might have the COVID virus. So I wish that my employer would have provided more COVID tests. And um, that is one thing. Um, I, I spoke, The caregiver who told me that majority of the um, of the clients on her floor passed away was also telling me that I wish that my employer had helped me to find a better way to deal with you know the the increased number of deaths that I observed so this caregiver in, in other sense was telling me that she want she wished she had had you know, some sort of, you know, therapy session to discuss how she was feeling and um, to even um, learn some skills to deal with the way that she had been feeling. So um, this is, these are some of the things that I want to discuss with employers today. I feel like um, at my school, for an example, three times a week, we had mental health sessions where, um, some for some sessions we were doing exercises like zumba for other sessions people were doing yoga for and for um one session that i really enjoyed we were performing meditation and through meditation i learned how to control my breathing and calm myself down so that i'm not so anxious all the time um i was so worried because when the pandemic first started, I was working in a facility that didn't really come out to, you know, tell us what was going on. I heard that we had COVID cases in this facility through other people, you know, through um, other caregivers. But because I wasn't very sure about whether the source was telling the truth or not, I was in so much, you know, anxiety the whole time. And it wasn't healthy for me. So um, for the employers, I feel like care caregivers want to have more um, sessions where they can learn how to even meditate, um, how to keep calm during um, situations that make them feel very anxious. Um, caregivers also want to have um, a safe space where they can come to and talk about, you know, how they are really feeling, you know, and um, it's like, if you ask me, like, Amma, how are you doing today? My, my automatic response will be, oh, I'm good. But when you ask me, how do you really feel? How do you feel about this particular situation? How is your relationship with your clients going in terms of the pandemic? Then you are opening up the door to several conversations that can be, you know, several, not just several conversations, but several deep conversations that can be, you know, talked about so that the caregiver's perspective or point of view can really, really um, come out. Caregivers also want to feel like, they also want to feel motivated. So I asked one of the caregivers, how do you feel your employer can motivate you? And they said, um, I, would I would like to have like a motivational message, something that um, tells me that there is somebody out there, you know, thinking about me. And with caregivers, it's easy for us to, we, we give so much of ourselves. You know, and we have such close relationships with our clients. But even though we have made a covenant to care for our clients, I feel like caregivers are also owed a covenant too. And someone must take you know, our well-being into account because sometimes we feel ashamed and we feel resentful to come out and say, this is what we actually need from our employer. And we feel like, oh, if, we are, if we've been put in this situation where we have to take care of somebody, then we cannot have any weaknesses at all. But that is not the case. Caregivers, we, we need care too. And as I've already talked about, um, 
we can also have you know videos like weekly videos or even monthly videos that talk about um, how to even control stress. What is stress? Some caregivers don't even know when they are stressed. They don't even know how to identify that, oh, um, me being irritable or me not having enough sleep or me eating too much might even be because I'm stressed. We don't know how to identify it. And we don't understand how, even though um, we don't understand how stress is affecting our body. And that is why a lot of caregivers go to work and we are snappy to our clients and we are not doing the work the way that we want to do, even as we have been called to do this. So um, these are the thoughts that I picked up from caregivers. Um, I do hope that the tips that I have shared um, resonates with a lot of caregivers. And um, I'm open to having quite answering your questions and any feedback that you have for me um, will be very much appreciated. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Amma. I love the call to action and the way you spoke from the heart was really powerful. So thank you for sharing your insights with us as a, as a CNA and caregiver. Um, let's open up the floor for questions. So if you have any questions or comments for Amma, um, just go ahead and put the questions in the Q&A. It's at the bottom of your Zoom screen towards the right. And um, we have um, Yvette Housen, who says, thank you, Amma. Oh, sweet. Welcome. Wonderful. Okay, so let's wait a minute and see if we have any questions. Um, I know that they're, oh, look at that. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Lynn. Lynn Riviera. Is that, a, is that someone you know? No. Oh, okay, <laughs> wonderful. Well, hi. Thank you for, thank you for commenting. Would you, do you have a question for Amma? Yes, okay, let's hear it. Ah, so while we're waiting for Lillian, uh, Denise says, thank you so much, but how do you take care of stress? So I know Denise, and Denise, thank you very much for your question. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think before we can deal with stress, that is if you know the signs of stress already, but every individual is different. For me, I know I'm stressed when I'm very, you know, first off, it's, it starts off like, oh, I'm so tired. I don't have any interest in doing anything. And then I'm very short tempered and I'm not as pleasant to be around, right? So when I start having these moments, which is not usual for me, then I know something is not going on, right? So I start to think, what are the things that are going on in my life? Do I have too much homework? Have I met this deadline? Or is there a deadline even coming up? So I, I start thinking about all the things that I, I should be doing. And to take care of stress, there are so many ways. Um, you can start by meditating. Meditate, I say meditation because I feel like it's very fast. You don't have to go to the gym and work on some exercise, right? Um, when you, you can meditate for a minute by doing you know, um, deep breathing. So um, one of the things I learned about deep breathing is it helps you to open up you know, your lungs and it helps to calm you down. And by doing that, some people have even been able to um, reduce um, their blood pressure because of deep breathing. Um, I, have a, I have a smart watch that reminds me every hour to do deep breathing. So you can also set a timer for yourself to do this you know, breathing exercises. Yoga, you can also do yoga. Yoga is one of the things that really helps to calm you down. If you really want to feel centered, you can try to do yoga. Some people also do Tai Chi. They feel like, you know, the slow movements of the Tai Chi um, helps them to combat stress. But um, one of the things that you can also do is talking about your feelings. Um, as I was doing my research, as I was doing my research for this presentation, I came across um, a helpline that is mainly for individuals in healthcare. You can call this line, that is if you don't have someone to talk to. You can call this helpline and talk to a live person 
who will just listen if you if you don't want them to talk they're not going to say anything they will just listen to you and you, it's a safe space to vent it's completely anonymous they don't have your number and you don't have to share any details about yourself they don't even encourage you to share details about yourself and if anyone is interested i'm very happy to provide this number for them so that you can call and share your feelings and also if you want you know any professional help they are willing to connect you to therapists who will be able to provide you with professional help so for me um i know i'm stressed when i'm you know very irritable or um i'm eating a lot <laughs> I'm eating a lot. So you can, that's also another sign that um, you can look out for, or even when I'm gaining weight, but obviously that comes from the eating. So yeah. <laughs> that is how I know. Thank you, Alma. Um, that's, that was a great response. We, we have a question now from uh, Yvette who says, Alma, what is the best way to have caregivers attend sessions on relieving stress and taking care of oneself? I'm an agency owner and I've made this a priority within my organization to aid my caregivers with the external pressures that they have to deal with, but I need their participation. So what can Yvette do? Yes, so I understand where you're coming from Yvette. Um, when I worked with the agency, um, we used to have monthly exercises and the only way they could get me to bring back the monthly exercises was, um, I mean, the only way they could get me to do these exercises was if I had to take a test, right? Or if I had to bring any, <laughs> anything in. So I would say maybe instead of having caregivers jump onto a Zoom call, if you're dealing with my aunt who's 70 year old and who does not know how to use Zoom, it's not gonna go very well, but maybe short clips of recordings of meditation sessions of you know yoga of exercises that can be emailed or texted and then caregivers need to respond with one or two things that they learned from whatever video that you shared with them. I think that would help. Yeah. That's a great suggestion. Um, we also have Mel says yes, meditation, deep breathing are all helpful. We agree. Mm -hmm. um, we will ask Alma for the number and we'll send it out to everyone who registered for the webinar. So you'll be able to get, um, get that. Um, Donan, Donum says, oh, this is great. Donum is on the call with 10 of his, or, his or, or their organization's CNAs or caregivers and they say, great message, Alma. So that's oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, um, an anonymous attendee says, how often do you think a caregiver should be tested for COVID-19? Um, so personally for me, um, I don't get tested by my employer. I get tested at my school. And although I'm not on campus, testing is free on campus. I get tested every week. You never know. And because I'm working in the home <coughs> I'm protecting myself, but I recommend that if it's free, you don't have to pay. Your employer doesn't expect you to pay for it. I think getting tested every week or every other week, depending, I would say every week to start with, but depending on the caregiver and how they feel about, you know, um, getting tested, maybe every other week will be useful also. Okay. Um, oh, listen to Lillian asks, have you, been, have you thought about becoming a registered nurse since you've been a CNA for a long time? Yes, um, that thought has crossed my mind and my sister is um, one of the people who is always encouraging me to, um, who actually in the beginning when I started taking community college classes wanted me to be become a nurse. But for some reason, I, I enjoy, you know, caregiving and when I, but when I've worked in hospitals, I've not really felt that connection, you know, to becoming a nurse. So I don't know, maybe it's in my future, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so David asks, I know caregivers need the money, but please take, uh, <laughs> oh, David is commenting. He knows that caregivers need money, but please take care of yourself, take a vacation, take a walk, do fun stuff for yourself. I concur, absolutely. Um, let's see, we have, um, how can we get, so Osmalis says, thank you, Amma, for the information. I thank you, Amma. Um, Pam would like to know, how can we get caregivers to admit to emotional stress? 
Uh, yeah, also caregivers will not give you the full information, but I think it's, you know, having, like I mentioned, deeper conversation. If you ask me, how are you doing, Ama? I'm going to tell you I'm fine because that is the automatic response. But having intentional conversation, hey, um, hey, Pam, let's have a meeting 8 a.m. on Monday. We are going to talk about your well-being with Mr. and Mrs. Smith. How does this job make you feel? Um, have you noticed any differences in... Um, how you know how you relate to others i feel like there are certain questions that when we are asking and maybe we also need to bring professionals in who know how to really probe and ask these questions to actually bring the answer out so yeah i think that would be the best thing to do because if we're talking friend as friend i'll tell you i'm okay unless you know i'm comfortable around you or unless you know i feel like whatever conversation that I'm actually talking to you about, I'm going to have some kind of feedback that will be beneficial to me. So maybe having a professional who really knows how to dig deep will be good. Yeah. Um, that was a great response. Pam says, great webinar. Self-care is not optional. We agree. Um, we have a question for me, Dr. Charlene. Do you know places where caregivers can be tested with expedience? Several of the testing centers have hours have long wait times. Yes, it's especially now as the rates are going up and more and more people are going for testing, it can be really hard to find places where you can get tested quickly. Um, the only place, the only way I know of that you, where you can get tested with expedience is actually quite expensive. There are um, more and more companies that are offering at-home collection test kits so you can actually do your own sample, um, send a nasal, like take a nasal swab, um, ship it out to a testing company and then they can deliver results. Um, that is, but that costs money and sometimes it's covered by insurance, but it's not the same as the free testing sites that you'll find around DC and Maryland. And so I don't actually know of any places that don't have the long wait times, unfortunately. Um, Mel has another question. Do you think having a life coach come in can help with that? Hmm. What do you think, Alma? I do agree. Um, I don't have a life coach, but I do have two mentors and I feel like that has helped me so much, not just in my um, in my education, but also in my personal life. I have a I have a mentor who helps me, you know, with my um, academics and also my career path. But then I also do have a mentor who does nothing with my education and just, you know, talks to me about my life path. Um, you know, just talk about my life and just sort of like a gut, give me guidance about how to do certain things. So yeah, and I've benefited a lot from that. So I think, yes, it, it will be beneficial. Yeah. Okay, great feedback for Mel. Um, here's another comment. I appreciate both of you for sharing these all important things with us. I enjoy being part of the webinar and would like the number for therapy assistance. So yes, we'll definitely- I'm so excited. <laughs> number. Uh, I think you're having a real impact on the people who've attended. Um, I, I have a question. I have a question for you, actually. So through the lens of as a CNA who's worked for multiple different agencies over the years and who's worked across different settings, um, what do you think, how do you think CNAs and caregivers can support one another in terms of self-care? Um. I think holding each other accountable, mm -hmm. like, um, yes, I think holding each other accountable. So um, in, in facilities, for an example, that is where when you work in home care, it's, it's a whole different ballgame. But when you work in facilities, that is the time where we can prioritize having like an accountability partner, right? Who would ask you things like, hey, have you done your meditation today? How many minutes of meditation did you do today? Or um, have you had your monthly check-in to discuss how you are feeling about the two clients who passed away on our floor today? You know, like things like that. I feel that would help. And also for caregivers who work in home care, I don't really know of, you know, a caregiver support group. Um, during this time, there used to be one at the Montgomery Mall in, um, in Potomac, but maybe this is an opportunity for us to start a WhatsApp group 
where caregivers can come in and you know support each other over there and share things that they have done during this time that has helped or you know not helped. Yeah. Is that something you're going to do? Start that WhatsApp group? <laughs> we'll <see. laughs> yeah, we'll see. Oh, I also want to mention this before I forget. I know a lot of caregivers have been impacted financially during this time. Um, a lot of food banks are empty, but the food bank at my church, thanks to God, um, is deliver um, is um, giving out free food every other Saturday. So if you're a caregiver um, worried about where the next meal is coming from, we're having our next donation on the 23rd of December. I'm personally going to be there distributing food. So please join us if, I mean, this will be of benefit to you. Yeah. Um, why don't we, nobody knows where your church is. And so what we can do is we can send that out in the information as well with the that for people who registered. Yes, awesome. Um, that sounds great. Um, I wonder, you know, you talked about the WhatsApp group and ways that caregiving professionals can support one another. Do you think agencies can build systems that enable their caregivers in their employee to support one another? Or do you think that's something caregivers really need to spare head for themselves? <laughs> I, there is no, you know, I think there is no one way to do it separately. I feel like having one for an agency would be good, but you know, caregivers want to have their own conversations on their own. So, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Well, instead of me and Alma just sitting up here chatting, let's see. Does anyone have any other questions um, before we we wrap up? Comments, thoughts, feedback, challenges. Does anyone disagree with something that Alma said? Yeah. And something that I can learn also that I didn't mention. <laughs> um, let's see. This information has been exceptionally helpful, not only to the CNAs, but to those of us who work behind the scenes with the agencies as staff. Thank you, Dr. Brown and to Alma for sharing, to, for those of us who work behind the scenes. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, oh, look, we have uh, Yvette agrees. They need to be able to fuss about the boss in private. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we have quite a few thank yous. Personally, I want to thank you, Alma. A, I want to thank you for being you. Um, literally, you are one of the most remarkable people I've met in my lifetime. And I'm really, really happy that you came back to do another webinar and to really speak truth, to really be um, transparent and clear and directive to the caregivers and to the agencies who are who were able to join the call. And those will be able to see the recording of this, of this webinar. Um, we have a resounding compliments from the, from the galley. Um, and Dhanam also concurs as someone who works behind the scenes that this has been really valuable. Uh, thank you, Ama. You know your stuff. I agree. Ama knows her stuff. Um, and that that's actually a really great note to, to um, oh, wait, there's one more, one more. Thank you. Lots of thank yous. And I thank you. And so before we, um, before we wrap up, I'm actually going to just take a moment and do a final thank you to all of the wonderful sponsors of this event. And so we have the Maryland Office of Preparedness and Response. It's part of the Maryland Department of Health. We have Minka. We have the Maryland Emergency Preparedness Network. And we have us. And so thank you, everyone who attended. Alma, thank you for your leadership as a CNA in Maryland and as an, as an individual who just finds ways to contribute and give back in society. And thank you to all of the attendees who came, who joined, and who asked such great questions and provided such great comments. We are thrilled that you were able to participate. And with that, we're going to close out. Have a wonderful holiday, but don't forget to join us. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> don't forget, I'm gonna do my, my final plug. Don't forget to join us. You can actually still register for the Monday webinar, aerosols and COVID, what home care clinicians need to know. You can see me um, at 4 p.m. Um, or you can join us on December 22nd at 7 p.m and hear the Let's Talk CNAs crew talk about how CNAs can help keep their clients safe when they're not at home. And, um, and in all of that, another question came up. 
So consider that the wrap up, but Lillian wants to know if you know of any agencies that have free CNA classes. Ah, I think you've inspired a new CNA. Lillian is exploring. Um, interesting. Well, the Caroline Center in Baltimore does offer free CNA classes. Um, they have an application process. And I know the community colleges in Maryland, multiple community colleges have received um, funding recently to support um, paying tuition for people who want to become CNAs. And so I recommend reaching out to your local community college and just calling and asking and finding your way to the people that can tell you whether or not they have funding. And of course, Google the Caroline Center in Baltimore and you can learn more there about what the cycle is for their um, application process to be considered there. But Lillian, we would love it if you became a CNA. So thank you. Thank you everyone. We're gonna close out. Bye. Bye-bye. Happy holidays.